Jesus, we come back now to your word and we just thank you for the text of scripture and ask that you would allow the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, our guide, our counselor to all the truth. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we come back this morning to this persistent question that we've been raising the last few days that we should never shy away from. Simply stated, why the word? Why scripture? Why the Bible? This is very important teaching about what the Bible says about itself that we've been studying here in 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. And I just want to take time to read that out again with you now. So if you turn to that in your own Bibles, 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable or adequate, equipped for every good work. This morning as we study this particular text again, it is quite simple in its structure. It's clear that there are three aspects to what we might call, I would call, the actual functioning of Scripture in our lives. How does Scripture function in how we live? That are given very serious attention here by the Apostle Paul. First, the active role of Scripture in our lives. Second, establishing a healthy background for the place of Scripture in our lives, and third, the overarching goal of Scripture for our living. So let's begin with some attention to the active role of Scripture, the Bible, in our lives right now, contemporary living. We read about that quite clearly in verse 16. All Scripture is inspired by God. We've covered that in some detail. But it goes on, and profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. I love how Paul describes the active role of Scripture in our lives here by saying it is profitable. It's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? It is profitable. It's using the term ophelimos in the original language of the New Testament, which means doing you good, or actually bringing profit to your life. Here, probably not so much in a financial way, although any of us would be happy for that, <laughs> but what is even broader in terms of whole life, holistic life profitability, as one of my favorite New Testament scholars, Richard Baucom phrases in whole life profit making. And then the text specifies this profit sharing activity of the Bible scripture in our lives by delineating it, spelling it out, as doing so by, Paul says, teaching. Profitable for teaching, referring, of course, to how it instructs you how it instructs me, all of us, in terms of God's ways and means and his purposes in this world that he loves. And it goes on, and by reproof, in which there must be some level of disciplinary action, like a good parent who actually is protecting their child by applying discipline and consequences when wrongdoing occurs, or on occasions of bad behavior. It is not loving, actually, to let bad behavior go unnoticed and dealt with, whether you're a six-year-old, a two-year-old, or a 67-year-old. <laughs> on the way here, on the airplane coming from London to <coughs> Philadelphia, 
we happened to sit in a section way at the back of the totally packed airplane and there was a child I love children usually on an airplane but this child was totally out of control seven no seven hours and 55 minutes of non-stop screeching it was horrific and maybe when she was sick maybe she had some problem we don't know about but I think there was not good rebuke from her parents anywhere in her life it was not fun we all kept earphones in just to drown it out people were trying to help the airline people were embarrassed like what do we do you know one of those situations and then it goes on by correction so we have here scripture is bent profitable for teaching for rebuke for correction and here, it's a very interesting term that has to do actually with steering, as in a corrective direction. When we get off course, the scripture serves to lovingly get us back on track for a healthy life that pleases our Creator God. And finally, for training in righteousness. That God does not simply command you to be righteous, and all that it means to be in right accord, straight. The word righteous means straight, straight with God. But he employs the Bible, the scriptures, to actually train you in life practices that will enable you to be righteous or to aspire to be righteous. All of these, you see, are drawing attention to the active role, not passive, not dormant, not quiet, active role of Scripture, the Bible, in our lives. This is what the Bible says about itself, what is its purpose. And what does this mean, actively? Well, it means that the Bible is not meant to sit on the shelf, gathering dust, or like an interesting artifact, or an academic novelty that you take a course in, as good as that can be. But it is to be studied, lived out, practiced, so that its active power, its purpose in your life can be released. On the way to breakfast this morning I was just so delighted to see some of the middle school children young people heading this way with an instrument in one hand and a Bible in the other to come to chapel I love that but we study in order to have it change our lives so now let us move on to consider the clear implications the clear emphasis in this Bible passage on what I would call establishing a healthy background for the place of Scripture in our lives. This is clearly referenced by the Apostle Paul here in terms of Timothy's own good family heritage and background. As we read in verses 14 to the first part of verse 15, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings. The stress in the grammar of the text is on the process of continuing in what someone has learned and become convinced of. You don't learn it once, it's a process. Music teaches you, if anything, the process of regular discipline, practice over and over and over again. And it stresses from whom someone has learned something of spiritual significance. You have people in your life who feed into you spiritually rich truth. And on the duration, a time element, referred to as from childhood. A long time Timothy has been seeped in good, healthy, spiritual nurture. 
through scripture. He was probably in his mid-twenties when Paul signed him to be pastor of this church in Ephesus. And then finally, in terms of the content of this teaching, what does Paul say? The sacred writings. Another way of talking about scripture. All of this, of course, strongly suggests a healthy family background in which the place of scripture, Bible in one's life, is firmly established. Faith and family is obviously important to Paul. As he earlier references Timothy's grandmother Lois, his mother Eunice, back in 2 Timothy 1.5. Lois, his grandmother, Eunice, his mother, again, don't overlook the obvious. Two women. Where's the man? Where's the father? Two women. Women are models of faith so often in Pauline theology. We talked about that a little bit yesterday. If that stirs up some more questions, come have a coffee with me. Now, for many of us, even here in a place like Chehi, and certainly with the people we work with in Glasgow, refugees from Islamic backgrounds, most of them have no family health. Unbelievable oppression and ugliness trying to get over the traumas of how a father treated them and insisted on very abusive rigors associated with mosque rules and regulations. And for many of you, I would not be surprised that as you hear about the place of family life in your faith development, even though many of you come from strong Christian homes, I know that from chatting with you. Still, many of you are going to be struggling with, well, what did it give me, really? I really get that, and I understand that. In my case, I had a father and mother who were just the most amazing models, and I want to share them with you. I have a photo of my father here. I wish I had a photo of my mom, too. She died just a few years ago, but he died very young. Medical doctor, missionary in Congo, where I grew up, DRC, Congo. And my mom and dad just so giving us a rich experience of not just Christian life, but the scripture. So they had, all through my dad's life, he read an English Bible and a French Bible because we spoke French in Congo. I remember at family table after supper, he would read a French verse, a verse out of the French Bible, and we'd have to memorize one verse in French just to keep it alive. Didn't do much good for us in the end <laughs> in terms of French proficiency. But such a rich heritage, and just his passion, his humility, his love for Jesus, he was the camp doctor here at Chehi for numerous summers when we were in Muncie. And I wish I could just share him with you. If your experience with a parent and the faith nurture was not healthy, I so wish I could just adopt you to my father and my mother. I would. And others of you have that. It's so, so important. But we can say we can be encouraged that wherever you are with that, we can start that process now to make sure that we now in our generation, in our experience, in the family life that we can start at the appropriate time when God perhaps gifts you with marriage, and family, children. And even in the communal family of the church, we begin now, this day, to establish healthy background for the place of Scripture in the experience of the generations that follow after us. And so finally and lastly, we come to see what the Apostle Paul says here about the overarching goal 
of Scripture in our lives. It's life-giving function actively. It's background in the family commitment. And now Paul makes very clear the overarching purpose or goal of Scripture as we live. We read it at the end of verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Did you catch the emphasis of that? The scriptures do not lead you to salvation. They lead you to wisdom that leads to salvation in Jesus Christ. Paul is very particular about that order. They are able, these sacred writings, to give you the wisdom that points you to that salvation which is only possible when you put your faith in Christ Jesus. Isn't it so interesting and compelling that salvation here, meaning that new life coming out of dead and deadening life, rescued, as it were, from all that death and sin wreaks havoc in our world, all of that is, according to the Bible here, a matter of wisdom. The sacred writings, the scriptures, give the necessary wisdom so as to enable you to even be aware that you need Jesus. You need salvation. It begins with wisdom. For most people, generally. I know, believe God deals differently with people with various handicaps for whom wisdom would be a struggle. But in general, this is what Paul is talking about. The sacred writings give the necessary wisdom to even allow you to know, I need to be saved. Pursuing salvation, you see, as presented here in 2 Timothy, is the wisest way. Not at all narrow, not at all small-minded, not anti-intellectual, whatever you have thought about the way of Christ, it is far from anti-intellectual or small-minded or narrow in focus, but it shows, in fact, the most broad-minded wisdom. And Paul says here that such wisdom, such necessary wisdom, comes from the sacred writing. The scriptures applied to our lives. Salvation, you see, rescue from sin and deadness and death eternally, derives, according to Paul, by wise choices. Wise choices that actually contend against foolishness, against all that mitigates against life-changing wisdom, or you could put it crassly, against Stupidity. Just being stupid. It's the wise way. It's actually the stupid or the foolish who ignore the need for salvation. As the psalm writer made it clear, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It is the height of wisdom, as Paul says here, that leads to salvation or in the simple vernacular, don't be stupid. That's a great intellectual truth for today. Don't be stupid. <laughs> Seeking salvation is simply the way of wisdom, not foolishness, ignorance, or stupidity. And where does this salvation come from? 
does not come from the scriptures themselves. The scriptures point to the way, as verse 15 ever says ever so clearly, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That's where salvation comes from. The scriptures simply give you the wisdom to see that and seek it out. And if we go back to my original contextual concern as an interlocutor with Muslim background refugees in Glasgow, it reminds me again of the question, how does this compare and contrast with the Quran? The Quran does not promise salvation at all. Islamic faith has no promised salvation. The only way you can be assured of salvation in Islamic teaching is through martyrdom. And it only hopes for salvation if perfection in one's life outweighs imperfection. But that is never known until judgment, unless you're martyred for the right reason. <laughs> now to bring this all home to you, dear young men and women, hear this incredible, inquisitive, sprite group called the Chamber Fest students. I want to conclude with a recent story of how this passage, this very passage, became the source of the saving experience of one of our women in Upper Room Church. I have her permission to tell this part of her story and show her photo. Her name is Mariam. She has a young daughter named Masa. Maha. 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 She's about nine or ten, maybe, eight or nine. She's nine. Carol teaches all the children in the church, so she will have Maha. This all happened one night when I was going to be teaching this very passage and talking about the difference between the Quran and the Bible as we've done these days. And as the gathering, many, many people, and you just have to get a picture of total mayhem, people running up, wanting your attention for a legal letter or just to hug you or, you know. And Miriam was desperate to talk to me, just desperate. She brought her friend Arafeh to translate. She's Kurdish, and Arafeh can speak her dialect of the Kurdish tongue. And I was just getting erupt, interrupted nonstop and finally there was no chance because the time was coming to start the service. We'd have this little countdown machine. It's the most ridiculous <laughs> music, but they love it. <laughs> I said, I can't talk to you, the time's out. In the end, it turned out to be God's timing for having her hear me teach this very passage first. And in this teaching, I said, as I've said a few times here, Many times, probably five and six times, it is a matter of wisdom. Don't be stupid. Choose wisely. It's a matter of wisdom. Don't be stupid. Choose wisely. And at the end of the gathering, it was just a perfect opportunity to just do a blatant invitation. Come forward if you want to choose the way of wisdom that will lead you to Jesus. And there was quite a queue of people to do that. But Mariam and Arafeh came running to the front. She had to tell me her story now. And her story was this. Two days before, she had had a dream. So many of our Muslim background people really meet Jesus because of a dream. And she was one of them. And in her dream, she described it so graphically, there were beings numerous beings in bright light pulling from her hands and her arms upward. But there are also beings in shadows and darkness pulling her legs and her feet downward. And she said, it was like in my dream, my body was like a, a uh, what is that game where you do with a rope? Uh, whatever that's called, tug of war. She said, my body was the rope of a tug of war between heaven and the dungeons of darkness and hell. Bright lights beaming and beams pulling upward on her hands and arms and darkness pulling her downward. 
and then she started to be teary and she said I only heard one audible voice and it only said it once and it said choose wisely that's all choose wisely and I had repeated over and over it's a matter of wisdom don't be stupid choose wisely and Mariam right there knelt with myself and Arafat Arafat translated as she said I choose Jesus I want to do the wise thing. The sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so I say to all of us, whoever is in this room, choose wisely. Don't be stupid. really not rocket science just don't be stupid to conclude to help you choose wisely some of the people in this room are here to help you do that and I know the faculty have a place in that but nobody has quite the place as the counselors that come to Cheney to be with you hours and hours and I'd like to ask the counselors that are here Stan, Addy, and Jonathan, and Sean, and I guess Allison had to step out. And I just want to pray for you and encourage you, students, go to them for, and also, Rian is here. Yeah, sorry, Rian. He's with the middle school, but he's available, and he's a good one. <laughs> to help you think about what does wisdom lead you to? Choose wisely. Seek them out. Say, what does that look like in my life? Maybe I'm already a Christian. I've made that choice. But there are other things I need to choose wisely. They are some of the best people in the whole wide world. They give their time to Chehi. So Jesus, I pray for Rian. Pray for Addie. Pray for Allison. Pray for Jonathan and Sean. Give them wisdom as they share their lives with these students. I pray for each one in the Chamber Fest student group. They would be bold to seek out input from wise counselors. Their teachers as well, but also, so importantly, these counselors who give day and night to them. So I pray you bless that. In the name of Jesus, amen.